Okay, so in this video, I want to go through a recent talk that I gave at Google for Machine Learning Singapore. And the whole idea is around in-context learning, new LLMs, and summarization, and showing you some behind the scenes of uh, a little app that I built to test some of these things out. So kicking off things, I would say what I'm talking about and what we're sort of interested in at the moment is LLM apps. And I don't know what version of kind of the LLM stack and LLM apps that we're working on, but it certainly feels like it's probably version seven now. Going back to the original LMs that we were using in 2018, GPT-2 apps and LLMs in 2019, and then progressing right up to nowadays with the latest OpenAI GPT-4, Gemini, and fantastic open source models like Llama 3, et cetera, as we're going through this. I think there are some key themes, though, that we can take away for developing these apps. And for me personally, the two big interests that I've got here around LLM apps are around personalization and curation. So I see these as being two of a number of things that are really changing to allow people to take use of this kind of technology more and more. So when I'm talking about personalization, again, here I'm talking about like the idea of how to make things the way you like them. And LLMs open up a whole world for this. We've got the ability to do personalized interactions. We can do personalized results so that every user gets a different set of results and stuff like that. An example of the personalized sort of interactions can be things like personalized levels. So when someone's learning something, rather than just have level one, level two, level three, you can actually make it so it can work out where the person's at and teach to that and support them at the level that they're at and grow their skills with this kind of thing. So this idea of personalization I see as being a huge factor in building LLM apps nowadays. The second area that I think is really interesting is the whole idea of curation. I think it's pretty obvious to most people that we're all well beyond data overload nowadays. There's just so much data out there that there's no way we can keep up with watching, you know, all the, the YouTube videos with reading blog articles with all this kind of thing. So really this is where agents and LLM apps can be like a filter on the world for us, that they can go out, look at source material, bring stuff back, use that. The whole idea here is that we really want to get what we need when we need it and try to filter out a lot of the other stuff that's going on here. And this brings me to a recent app that I built that I really wanted something that did really good high quality notes of YouTube videos and other content. And I started out with YouTube videos, but I've added to this over time as you go through. Now, one of the challenges for most sort of summarization and stuff like that is you end up with very short summaries of videos. And actually what I'm more interested in than just a summary, I'm actually interested in a set of notes. So this is an example of one of the Stanford overview on Transformers video. You can see here that I've basically got a system where I'm building like a whole bunch of different notes around different sections of the video going through and putting this together. Something that I've been looking at and working on for quite a, a while with different levels of success in here. The whole idea for doing something like this is that we can basically give it, you know, a transcript with timestamps and then it can turn that into a full set of notes that we can use for a variety of different things. And so that this sort of brings us the whole sort of curation aspect that I'm interested in. But then the other thing that I'm interested in as well is that often you want notes that are different. Sometimes you want a full set of notes. Sometimes you just want a very short summary. Sometimes you want action items for going through this. And then on top of that, you often want to basically pick a sort of context that you want the notes in. So if I want a set of notes as an AI researcher, that's quite different than the set of notes that maybe if I'm trying to skim to learn a new topic or a new subject, I want a set of notes that sort of highlights the statistics mentioned in there, as opposed to just general notes. This is the sort of personalization aspect coming into play here. So in the app here, you can basically come in to your account and you can set up different kinds of profiles. So the idea here is that you can set up a profile that sets up key sorts of things that are interesting to you to get the information out for a summary. And you can combine that with a summary type 
to get a better level of summarization and a better level of personalized curation. That's what I'm going for here. Now, the, the key thing is what I want to talk about more is like some of the key things around what it took to build something like this, and also fundamentally the sort of new way of thinking about building some of these apps and certainly how I've changed over the last few months. Now to get into that, we need to talk about like the state of LLMs. So if we go back in history a bit, the idea was that we had a bunch of sort of foundation models. If we go back a year or two. You had some foundation models from Google. You had some foundation models from OpenAI, maybe one or two other companies there. The key thing though, was that in these foundation models that everyone was focused on the best quality model. Now, even though the organizations may have had different versions of the model at different tiers and stuff like that, often they didn't make those public. If we jump forward to now, we see that, okay. There's still, the big players are still the same, but we've now got the addition of a lot of other models coming into the scene here. And these models have caused everyone to reevaluate how you're actually picking a model, how you're doing things like this. So I'd say that now we're starting to fall into these categories of best model, best quality model, which is what most people still judge things about, meaning usually the biggest model with the best scores on MMLU, with the best scores on GSM8K, that kind of thing. And then at the other end of the, the spectrum, which I'm going to talk about in a sec, is this whole idea of smaller proprietary models that are still way bigger than most of the open source models, but they're much faster. They can still be used for lots of different tasks and they end up being much cheaper. Unfortunately, there's some models that end up being in the middle here. So you end up with a bunch of these models that are in the, the middle here, and they suffer from being too big to perhaps run easily, quickly, cheaply, fast, or they're just not good quality models. And meaning that they're too big that if you look at models on par with them, they're just so much better that it's very hard to justify running a lot of these models for this. So I think with Llama 3 coming out recently, we've seen a lot of the sort of model developers just really become a lot less relevant here in, in this sort of situation because people can use Llama 3, they can use other models if they want to run something small and local, or they can go for the really big ones if they want the most intelligent model up there. But being a big model that's not in the top tier of intelligence out there, it re really means that for a lot of people, it's not going to be a really relevant kind of thing. So we've also seen this move to having families of models. So Google wasn't the first one to do this, but when Gemini announced, they basically had a whole sort of suite of models in here. And so they've, you know, got Gemini Ultra 1.0, Gemini Pro 1.0. The Gemini Nano models, which are really more for mobile, so I'm not going to count them too much in this. And then you've got things like Pro 1.5, where they blew out the context window for the first time to have sort of a million token context window, which is totally awesome. It allows for you to do a lot of different multimodal things of video, of audio. Does it kill RAG? No, not at all. This is, I think, becoming more and more clear to people that RAG is still going to be around for a long time. The challenge with models like Gemini Pro 1.5 is that firstly, just the speed is that it's pretty slow. If you put a million tokens in there, it's going to take a few minutes to give you an answer out for that. And the second biggest sort of issue with this is that when you're doing something out, you're only getting 8,000 tokens. You're not getting like a full million tokens in, million tokens out possibly, or even a million tokens in, 100,000 you're getting 8K out. That means that currently in the, the state that they're in now, these models, and it's not just the Gemini ones, it's from other providers as well, are not something that you can basically use for a long output. So if you think about it, there are lots of use cases for long outputs out there. If you want to write a book, or more importantly, if you want to edit a book where you basically give it a whole book to and have it go through and change all the time it sees a name or something like that or do certain kinds of things in there that perhaps a little bit more complicated than just find and replace it would be great if we could go a hundred thousand tokens in a hundred thousand tokens out at a time 
But unfortunately, that's not the case. Another use case of this would be just transcribing long audio. So while Gemini 1.5 Pro can take in 10 hours of audio, it's not like you can get a transcript of that out because that's going to be greater than the 8,000 tokens in here. And one of the biggest use cases that I've personally been looking for is a way of how can we get long summaries and long forms of note taking. And this is what this is all about in here. So recently, Sam Altman said something like this, and I'm paraphrasing it a little bit, that he said that there are two main strategies for building on AI right now. Assume the models will not improve much and build things on top of current capabilities, which I think he said that if you do that, OpenAI will steamroll you for doing that. Or B, build, assuming OpenAI will keep improving the models at, at a rapid pace. I think there's like a middle ground here. There's actually a third option that, yes, the models are definitely going to get better. This year, we're going to see better models out with perhaps new GPT models, new Gemini models, new Claude models later in the year, that kind of thing. But even with those models getting better, we have to ship products with what we've got now. And we have to find new ways to be able to do things with what we've got now. And this brings me to the idea of making use of this new class of model that's coming out. So the one that I'm going to focus on is Haiku in here. But there are others coming from other players as well. This is, I think Haiku was probably one of the first ones out like this. So the thing that I would say about this new sort of tier of models is that these models are getting very strong benchmarks. They're not the best. So for example, in the Claude 3, obviously the Opus model is the big model with Sonnet being the middle one, Haiku being the lower one. These new models are not the best models out there, but they have very strong benchmarks. And on top of those benchmarks, they're super performant, meaning that their speed is really good. They have still have very big context windows for putting things in. And generally the tokens are going to be quite cheap in this. So if we look at why Haiku that I'm focusing on here is that we've got something that one is multimodal, that two, we've got a really long context window. If we want to go out to that context window. We've got something that is super cheap in here. If we look at the, the pricing in here, we can see that Haiku is only 25 cents per million tokens input and 125 per million tokens output. Comparing that to the top of the line where it's $15 for the input tokens and $75 out for the output tokens. So this cheapness allows us to do a lot of different things. And then the speed comes in totally, you know, for this, the whole idea of having a very fast model really changes the game in what you can actually do with these kind of things. Now, the other sort of example of this that I would say that we're seeing at the moment, which is pretty good is Meta's Llama 3 model on Grok or powered by Grok, as they like to say. So that basically allows you to get very fast tokens out. It's very performant in these kind of ways. And we know that the Llama 3 model, 70 billion model is actually a very good model for long stuff. The only issue with this one currently is the lack of multimodality if you wanted to do something with images in. So there are some challenges that come with using Haiku. For a start, you're often going to need to tune your prompts a bit more. You're going to need different prompts than the OpenAI models. One of the Biggest challenges though, is actually getting quota at the moment from providers to do lots of calls. So if you're going to put something into production, getting quota on GCP, where there's a version of Haiku on uh, Bedrock on AWS, get a version there. And even from Anthropic themselves, you're generally going to be pretty limited about the number of queries per minute that you can actually do for this. And as I'm going to show you with this summarization app, that becomes actually quite important that Yes, each call to the LEM is going to be, you know, incredibly cheaper than it was before, but we're going to make a lot more calls to the LLM as we go through this and do this. So if you want to tune prompts for this, go and have a look at the meta prompt. I did a whole at the meta prompt for, for Claude 3. I did a whole video about this. This is where it basically writes the prompt for you. It goes through and does a number of different things. If you're interested in that, check out the video for, for that. Haiku's got some other interesting things in that you should be using XML tags with it. It tends, seems to respond uh, a lot better to XML tags than to JSON for putting things in and out. 
on the whole, though, that's not something that, that's really key. And then the, the, the sort of last thing I would say is, so when we're talking about this new area of smaller proprietary models that's out there, one of the biggest advantages here is that you can basically add more in-context learning right? So you can add more few shot examples. And where in the past people would go for sort of three shot or five shot, maybe eight shot for the few shot examples. Now it's not a big deal to go for 20, 30, 50 different examples in here. And recently there was a really interesting paper that came out, that came out from Google DeepMind called Many Shot in Context Learning. And the idea here in the paper is that they, rather than where conventionally people are using three to eight sort of examples, they started what would happen if you went to 50 examples, if you went to 500, if you went to 2000 examples here. And you can see that for a variety of different benchmarks that they looked at, just massively increasing the number of exemplars or examples that they're passing in allowed the models to do a lot better. So you can see a bump for the many shot ICL versions. Now you can see that some of these are going like 512 examples, 128, 50, 248, et cetera. And the, the thing is, there's also been some papers that are showing some really interesting things that the more few shot examples you're using, you're actually then starting to make it more like you're fine tuning the model in the way that you want it to go as well. That seems to be the case, especially with these proprietary models, often maybe perhaps even more so than the open source models that are out there. So using exemplars and examples in Haiku is a really good thing that you can do to basically guide the model. And you tend to wrap them in XML tags here. So you can see I've got an example. Here are eight examples of grade school math with step-by-step, -step, and then we just wrap them and stuff like that. The model then is able to work this out, and it's going to then be much more primed to give a better response on these kind of things. Now, this not only works for things like this, it also works for things like any sort of function calling, any sort of react prompting, anything where you're trying to get it to make decisions and stuff. The more examples that you can stuff in there, the better the quality that you get coming out of there. All right. And this brings us to summarization. So I showed you the app a little bit before here. Summarization has been a challenge for natural language understanding and natural language processing people for quite a long time now. In the past, everything was extractive versus abstractive, you know, with extractive being where you're basically just pulling out sentences from the original document or from what someone said on a video, that kind of thing. And abstractive has been where we're doing like rewriting f for this kind of thing. But I'm going to say that nowadays you actually want to think about summarization in some different ways. Most summarization now is going to be abstractive summarization, but you really want to think about summarization as personalized summarization. So this is tailoring the summaries to user preferences or user interests, aspect-based summarization, where you're getting the summary to include very specific things like facts and figures, statistics, that kind of thing, so that it doesn't try and summarize those concepts. It puts those in as it's sort of getting them out here. And then there's a whole sort of field of dialogue summarization, that when you're actually building something to summarize interviews and conversations, it's actually quite different than when you're trying to just summarize general presentations or teaching videos, that kind of thing. So let's look at some of the ways that people do summarization with LLMs. So the best way, if you can do it, is basically just to have your input documents, a prompt, going into the LLM, and then coming out with the summary in one shot. This is what we would call simple stuffing for this. And while this can get really good results, the challenge here is that you can't do it for really big documents. And certainly in the past, people couldn't do this. So in the past, one of the big things people did was map reduce. So where you'd basically take your document, you break it up into chunks, you then pass the chunks through one at a time to the LLM with a prompt, and you get multiple summaries out, which you then combine in some way, shape, or form. This has been very you know, popular with Langchain from the start. People have used this kind of thing. The biggest challenge that you have here is that if you have something in chunk number two 
that refers to something in chunk number seven, those are not in context at the same time. So it's much harder for it to be able to pick up that you should be taking this and you should be taking something else in, in there. A sort of variation on this that people used a lot to was refining over calls. So each time we're passing in our summary and adding to it and, and keeping what we had from before, deciding what is more important, that kind of for going through this. There are also techniques where people do re-ranking of, of the chunks to work out which chunks are the ones with the most, with the best information in them. So what I want to show you is a new way that I've been doing summarization for this app and how it works going through this. So because you're using something like Haiku where it's quite cheap, et cetera, you're going to do multiple calls to the LLM, but the calls are going to be slightly different than just something like MapReduce or something. So the first call is going to basically get sort of sectioning information from this. Now, if I go back to the example uh, that we had here, you can see that we've got sections being extracted out. Those are not fixed sections. The model is deciding when the topic changes from one thing to another. So this whole idea is what I would call sectioning. So our first call would be like a sectioning call. Then what we do is we basically pass in the full document for each time, but tell it just to summarize that particular section. So we give it the timestamps and stuff like that. And so the summary that it's putting out here is just for this section, even though I'm giving it the full document. The advantage of this is that if something in that part of the document refers to another section, it's got that in its context learning that it can actually use that to still summarize this section in here. So you've got the advantage because we've got these long context windows of being able to put in full 30,000 tokens or something for a YouTube video. But then we've got the benefit of basically getting out individual summaries, which when combined can be far longer uh, than the 8,000 token window that we get out for something like this. So using Haiku here allows us to get a very large amounts of input tokens very cheap. Haiku itself is good enough generally to discover the sections. If you wanted a better way of getting the sections, you can actually go for a bigger model for that first call to get your sections and then just pass it into the Haiku for the rest. Again here, because you're using a model which is extremely cheap and still very fast, you shouldn't be afraid of having long prompts or long contexts in there. Not only can you put the full context of the the video in there. You can also put a bunch of different few shot examples in there of how you'd want certain things to be pulled out for it, for that kind of thing. At this stage, like 40,000 tokens is only going to be one cent for this. So this is something that you should think about as well. And then finally, one of the things that you can do with some of the models is that you can do a lot of these calls in parallel. So once we've got this call done, None of these calls are actually reliant on each other. They basically just rely on that first call that we've got there. So that allows you to do a lot of things in parallel as you go through this. So you can see here's an example of some of the sectioning that comes out where I'm getting it returning each section in an XML tag. It's got the timestamp in there. It's got a whole bunch of things in there as you go through this. And if you get your prompt, you should get the sections for the entire thing as we go through in here. All right, so the advantages of doing this is that you can get an LLM to focus just on just a section, but in the context of the full document that you've got going here. This is a big advantage for getting better quality summaries. You can pass the entire transcript, document, article, something in. You can get longer summaries at the end that go way beyond 8,000 tokens or rather longer sets of notes at the end that go way beyond the 8,000 tokens. What are the disadvantages of this? Definitely it's using a lot more tokens. That's not such a big issue though when you've got something like Haiku where the tokens are just so cheap. Probably the biggest disadvantage is that the more calls that you need are not going to be, the, the price is not going to be the big thing there, but just making sure that you've got quota to do calls. So when I opened up the summary app for some test users, 
one of the things was it started crashing because it was going beyond the 60 queries per minute that it was allowed to do on that platform and something like that. So you will need to basically, if you're going to put something into production, you'll need to make sure that you can get access to more quota for this kind of thing. In conclusion, just to finish up, I would say that you really should be evaluating your LLMs, the choice of LLM that you're picking, not just on academic benchmarks or something like that, and not just even on picking the best model all the time. You really want to pick the model that is right for the level of use that you're going to use. And often that's going to mean that you're going to pick a smaller variant of a proprietary model that is going to be very fast and very cheap for this. Now, yes, you can run open source models and stuff like that. For most people, while there's certainly cases for that, I would say for most people, you actually are going to be much better off just going with a service provider that gives you a sort of fixed price per token for doing this rather than having to pay for GPU time that often perhaps you don't need or you only need parts of it, that kind of thing. Another conclusion that I would say is don't be afraid to use lots of tokens for inputs. I see this time and time again that people are constantly trying to prune their prompts to try and save money and stuff like that. Usually, more often than not, that actually just means you end up getting worse results. So you're better to go for the cheaper model and actually use more tokens than just trying to basically budget your tokens on a really big model. Use the big models when the cheap models fail. So for certain things, you will need a big model. But the cheaper models, things like Haiku, and, and there are others coming from the big providers and stuff like that, these models are getting smarter and smarter with each iteration. So that these sort of second or third tier, but really fast models are now, you know, well beyond models that we were using a year ago for doing this kind of thing. Adding to this, I would say that context is often far more important than choosing the best LLM. Think about that when you're building your app and, and doing those various things. In And finally, then just think about how you're calling the model rather than just one call to do one thing. With the introduction of these sort of smaller models and with the introduction of things like Llama 3, 70 billion on Grok, Suddenly now, we really want to be thinking about multiple calls often to do one thing. And that can be things like where you're including checking the output, self-reflection, reflexion, that kind of thing. That can be tool use, checking tools, checking function calls, that kind of thing. But you can have multiple calls that are very quick on these platforms like Grok and still using a really good solid model like Llama 370 billion in there. So anyway, hopefully this was useful in getting you to understand some of the changes that we're seeing in the LLM space at the moment. And I'm pretty sure you're going to see these choices roll out even more over the next few months, etc. for this. All right. As always, if you've got any comments, please put them in the comments below. Any questions, put them there as well. If you found the video useful, please click like and subscribe. And I will talk to you in the next video. Bye for now.